For the second part of this lecture, we're going to cover scientific method, Dalton's atomic theory, and the idea of atom element compound and molecule. This course is titled Chemistry a Molecular Science. So just to give you an overview of how we're going to proceed during the semester, initially we're going to examine the history of chemistry in the first few chapters. Then we'll look at individual chemical components. By the time we get to chapter six, we'll look at encounters between different types of chemical components. And in particular, we want to cover precipitation reactions, electrochemistry, and acid-base reactions. We'll even get a little into organic chemistry for those of you who are proceeding on to Chem 221. Even if you're not going to organic chemistry, it's always good to know a little bit of organic chemistry since so many things are made of organic molecules. A definition of chemistry is the study of matter and the changes it undergoes. And it's a science. So we're going to explore chemistry by means of using the scientific method. Different textbooks have a different collection of terms they use for scientific method, but I'll stay true to our textbook. It has the shortest set of definitions. Scientific method starts by observation. I propose to you that you've been using the scientific method all your life, whether or not you have the official definitions, because all of you were babies at one time. And Eventually, you got to the point where you were eating solid food, and most of you used the Cheerios wet hand method. You would use your wet hand, and the Cheerio would stick to it, and then you would hold your hand up to your mouth and sort of gnaw the Cheerio off the side of your hand. All of you did this. I know this. There came a day when your parents said, gee, I'd really like to go out to eat at a restaurant. And we need to teach this child to use utensils. So at some point, your mother gave you a spoon. And you weren't very coordinated at that point in your life. So a lot of times, you would accidentally drop the spoon over the side of the high chair. And here is your observation that you would make. When that spoon fell to the floor, your mother would come and get the spoon. And if you're the first child, she would take that spoon, bring it to the sink, carefully sterilize it and wash it, and then give it back to you. Now, if you're a second or later child, I'm very sorry, but she would typically just give the spoon back to you or maybe give it a mouth rinse with their own mouth. That's just the way it goes. And it's not your fault. It's because the oldest child occasionally ate stuff off the floor and she didn't get to them and stop them from eating it, and they were fine. So your oldest sibling trained your mother that a few germs were okay. So back to the observation. You notice that you, when you drop the spoon, your mother comes and she gives it back to you. So you form a hypothesis. This mother person is a spoon picker-upper. I bet if I dropped the spoon, she would come pick it up. So you formed a prediction. And then you do the experiment. And anybody who's ever babysat knows that there's a point where the child takes the spoon, dangles it over the side of the high chair, and then very deliberately drops it and looks at you with a smile on their face. That's the experiment, and all of you did this. You did the experiment to see if your hypothesis that mom was a spoon picker-upper and your prediction that other people, including mom, would pick up the spoon were true. So you ran this experiment. And in chemistry, we would run the experiment several times. So initially, when you run the experiment, you might confirm the hypothesis. But do you think there's a point at which the experiment doesn't work? Maybe three drops of the spoon or five drops of the spoon? And you realize that there's a limitation to your hypothesis and you have to modify it. I can only drop the spoon four times. 
By the fifth drop, I'm never getting it back. So by doing this cycle, you refine your ideas and you may come up with a theory, which is a detailed explanation of several experiments that is consistent. The theory will explain your observations. Or you may come up with a very simple law that works just for that particular situation and summarizes observations. So I guarantee you that you have used the scientific method this time and multiple times throughout your journey to adulthood. So chemistry has many examples of scientific method where we thought things worked one particular way and discovered later that they were different. Here's a theory that initially was very well bought into in the past, and that was the idea that magnesium ribbon, when it burns, gives off something called calx of magnesium and phlogiston. Now, if you've never seen magnesium ribbon burn, let me show that to you. We'll go to this link here and I'll show you a brief amount. The burning of magnesium. And now I can release it. And you see how it just crumbles. So what you saw in that video sort of looked like a sparkler. The magnesium, which was the gray ribbon, eventually turned into a white powder and it gave off a lot of bright white light. So the theory was when magnesium burns, it gives off this bright white material called phlogiston and leaves behind the shell of the magnesium called calx of magnesium. Now, if you have not enjoyed the stoichiometry problems, the person to be annoyed with is Lavoisier, who in the 18th century transformed chemistry from a science of observation to the science of measurement. He modified the experiment so that he measured the amount of magnesium that was being burned as 24 grams, and then measured the shell of the magnesium left over as being 40 grams. And that by necessity means that phlogiston had a negative mass of 16 grams. Now, up to this point, nobody had found anything that had negative masses, and it didn't make sense. So, the theory was revised to the idea that magnesium of 24 grams reacted to make magnesium oxide of 40 grams and took in 16 grams of oxygen. And he confirmed this by having a container filled with oxygen and determining the amount of mass of oxygen that was lost when the magnesium burned. So, mass in equal mass out, theory revised. And you're gonna see a bit of this throughout the semester where we start with a simple theory and then have to build upon it and add modifications to make it fit all the circumstances. Lavoisier was the founder of the law of conservation of mass, which says during a chemical reaction, the total mass remains constant. Now that law was a very simple distillation of observations. A theory tends to be more complex and involves several laws and explanations. So here's an example of a theory that we use today, John Dalton's atomic theory. His first proposal was the smallest unit of an element is an atom. Elements are composed of the same type of atom, and the elemental form of many types of atom is simply the atom itself. So for an example, if you have one atom of neon, it contains all the properties of a lot of neon. One neon atom is representative of the qualities of the element neon. But there are some elements out there that in their most stable form are composed of multiple atoms. So for example, we don't find hydrogen atoms alone, typically, in their natural state. We find H2 
two molecules together. So H2 is the elemental form of the hydrogen atom. Carbon we don't typically find alone. You might find it as 60 of them together. Sulfur typically likes to be in a group of eight, and phosphorus can be in a group of four. So these are elemental forms of materials that are more than one atom. The same type of atom is going to have identical characteristic properties. So it doesn't matter if you get your iron from the United States, or from Russia, or from a meteor. It all has the same properties. Posit two of this theory is that atoms combine to form molecules. Molecules are composed of two or more atoms. Now molecules can be subdivided into two types. There are elements, which have the same type of atom, and compounds, which are composed of different atoms. So phosphorus alone is an atom, whereas P4 is a molecule and also the element form of phosphorus. Here phosphorus is an atom, but if it's combined with a different type of atom, like oxygen, to make P4O6, we would call P4O6 a molecule and a compound. And finally, atoms are not changed in the course of a chemical reaction. They simply change partners. So you can take iron, which is an atom and an element, and combine it with oxygen, which is a molecule and an element, and you will get iron three oxide, which is a molecule and a compound. Now this applies only to chemical reactions. Remember, nuclear reactions, the atoms do change, but that's beyond the scope of this class. This particular part of the theory is the one we used to do the limiting reactant problem. And it's consistent with the law of conservation of mass and our basis for balancing reactions. So in summary for you, there's an atom, which is the smallest component of an element. These would be things that are composed by protons and neutrons surrounded by electrons. We'll get to that a little later if you haven't heard of those things. So examples are sodium, boron, or iron. Element. This is an atom or group of the same type of atoms that is the most stable form on our planet. Examples are sodium being alone or P4 being a group of four phosphoruses. Then there's compounds. These have different atoms in them. So CO2 or H2O would be excellent examples. And finally, there's a molecule. These are more than one atom bound together, so they can be elements or compounds. And this, of course, is a periodic table of the elements. And you notice that each element has its own particular symbol associated with that type of material. Now I'm going to suggest for this class that you memorize the first 36 names and symbols if you're not very familiar with the periodic table. It's kind of like memorizing your multiplication tables. You can survive without memorizing them, but it's a lot slower if you don't know that six times eight is 48 and you have to put that into your calculator. Not only should you memorize the symbols, but you should memorize the elements that exist as diatomic molecules. So these are listed here, and the two other odd ones, phosphorus four and sulfur with eight. Let me show you a few tricks on the periodic table that will help with that memorization. First off, there are some tricky ones. If I tell you that potassium is a group 1A metal cation that has a charge of plus one, and you hear your potassium, which starts with a P, and you're looking over here, that explanation is going to make no sense to you. P is for phosphorus, and K is for potassium. And if I tell you that sodium is a group 1A metal cation that typically has a plus one charge, and you hear sodium with the S sound, and you're looking over here at sulfur, 
No, you need to be looking at NA over here. So you notice there are a few unusual ones. Now as far as the diatomic ones, these are typically found in this upside down L formation right here. So it's not N, it's N2, O2, F2, Cl2, Br2, I2, and over here, don't forget H2 for the hydrogen element. So here are some questions for you to think about and answer. How would you describe Br2? For the next one, how would you describe N? Just one nitrogen atom alone. How would you describe N2O? All right, that concludes this part of the lecture.